Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning, morning. morning, teacher. Yeah. (laughs) All right. We're starting a brand new quarter today. Thirteen Sundays, seven of them are going to be talking about why we need the Bible. And we're starting with that very first one today why we need the Bible. You know, uh, this is just an offhand comment and remark, but um, I suppose that probably the majority of people in our country don't need the Bible. They just, um, they just cruising along somehow. I don't, I don't really know how uh, all of that works, but it's, it's up to the spirit of God to go to individuals and to put in them the desire. For, uh, for having uh, um, uh, the, well, I guess I said it already, having the desire to read the Bible or to look at it or to go to church even. I think that probably the majority of the people in our country do not even go to church let alone needing the Bible. So they get along without it somehow. Uh, But I do not know how. Uh, And and I don't want to get along without it. uh, To to God be the glory. Um, I'm glad I've got uh, something in me that that causes me to want to do this. To anyone I say do this, I'm talking about read the Bible. Talking about coming to church. Talking about worshiping. Uh, But I think that there are, uh, I'm far outnumbered by people who, who do not. Anyway, uh, the first lesson that we have uh, in this uh, series is called The Authority of Scripture. Well, just that title turns a lot of people off because they don't want anybody to have authority over them. And they don't want some book that has words in it. No pictures, uh, maybe maps, anyway. It just seems like on TV that all the people are submitting to authority. I don't know what you're talking about. You're not going to explain that to truth. I watch different channels. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I stopped watching it. I was going to say, I stopped watching it. It's discouraging, you know. Yeah. Uh, so, so people just... Um, aren't willing to submit is basically what it amounts to, or at least in, <clears throat> in my observation. They're not willing to submit themselves to the authority of anything. And uh, the, the first, perhaps, and I don't, I don't know, I know I'm just kind of stuttering around here, and I don't mean to be, I'm, I'm fishing for, as the, as the Spirit leads yeah. me to uh, talk about creation, that, that we have to realize that there's a creator, but majority of people don't realize that. So they... Uh, they're on the channel, the TV channels that Tom watches. <laughs> <coughs> uh, 
But the scriptures are inspired by God for our instruction and spiritual growth. And we're going to start today in uh, Paul's writing. And I've got uh, the books uh, listed on the, by, uh, on the board here today. We're going to start in 2 Timothy. Paul's letters to friends, it says. And he wrote one to Timothy, and then he wrote two to Timothy and Titus and Philemon. Anyway, <coughs> this is about... Uh, uh, it's, it's a good bit closer to the back of the Bible than it is to the front, okay? So that you can find... Second Timothy, and we're in chapter uh, chapter three, um, and it's just. The, let me tell you, I, I don't mind admitting that that, that uh, topical lessons, topical lessons like this one, uh, talking about the authority of Scripture, and like for that matter, the next few weeks. Uh, are, 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 are not my favorite kind. I like to read scripture uh, like starting at the beginning of a chapter in a book and read all the way through that as opposed to jumping around in scripture and picking up references to particular things. But, but that's what the kind of lesson is today is the authority of Scripture. And we're going to look at it being divinely inspired. When Paul wrote to his friend Timothy, Timothy was a young fellow that uh, Paul was trying to groom to be the pastor of, of, of um, probably mostly older people and it was a tough job we're not going to cover those kinds of scriptures today but but there are scriptures that indicate that sort of thing but here in in second timothy chapter 3 verse 14 is where we're going to start Paul says to Timothy, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Now, that last phrase, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, you see, in our, everybody's general life, uh, you have to be careful who you're learning from. There are things that you can learn by observing all these people that are out there that living without the Bible and living without church. You can learn stuff from them, but I don't suggest it. It won't, won't be any good for you. It won't uh, feed your soul. So Paul is saying to Timothy here, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. He goes on to say that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures. Now, the Holy Scriptures he's talking about there is the Old Testament. Any Jew worth his salt, so to speak, learned the Old Testament. And they, they usually learned them at some parochial school, some Jewish temple, outside under the fig trees in the shade where there was a breeze blowing 
that sort of thing. Uh, um, they've, I guess they had some inside classroom as well, but, but the, from a child, in verse 15, thou hast known the Holy Scriptures. They are able, or which are able, to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Now there's that word towards the end of verse 15 that I, for lack of a better description, I'll say I harp on it all the time. I'm telling you that when the word faith is used in the New Testament, it's it, it's referring to, do you believe that Jesus of Nazareth is the Christ? Do you believe he's the Messiah? You, yeah, you have to have faith that he is. Uh, it, it, faith is, a lot of times it's confused in church settings um, faith is confused with something that you can conjure up by, uh, by standing in a circle and holding hands and closing your eyes real tight and, and praying for faith. Well, let me tell you, folks, you either believe that Jesus of Nazareth is the Son of God or you don't. And, and that, kind of, that it can't be, it's not something that can be conjured up. Then he goes on, verse 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Now, all of those things are, uh, uh, I'm gonna say equally important they, 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 they all matter. But I want to, at this point, go back to where we were at the end of verse 14. Knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Now, the people that Timothy has learned them from is, is basically three people. One of them is Paul. Paul has taught him. But even before Paul knew him, he was taught by his mother. And he was taught by his grandmother. Uh, as I recall, one of them's name was Eunice and the other one Lois. I don't, I don't remember which one was which, but as long as they know which one was which, it's, 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 it's okay, but the point is here that Timothy learned from his mother. Now, I, I'm sorry that it doesn't say much about Timothy's dad. I, uh, I, I don't, I don't mean any uh, disrespect at all, and what I'm about to say, but, but boy, when, when, when I uh, finally croak, I would like my children. Are you turning into frog? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> froggy, froggy, froggy one a courting. No. <laughs> uh, uh, I would like my children <coughs> to be able to say that they learned scripture from their dad. Now, I don't mean any disrespect to their mother. Let me tell you, their mother taught them lots of things 
while I was at work. She, and I was fortunate enough to have a, a, a professional job where I uh, went off to work every day and left the children in the care of the mother. And I know what the mother's routine was, that uh, in her bedroom beside her bed, she would get down on the floor to pray and talk to God. And the little children's that we had just kind of played on her, climbed on her back and rolled off to one side. And they just was kind of around there. And, and it, was, it was in that um, atmosphere that, that they learned the basic principles of, of God. Now, let me tell you, and this has got nothing to do with anything, it's just, it's, it's just something, uh, is that we have, a, we have a piano that I bought, uh, or we bought, uh, in 1973. Uh, a a Koi grand, grand piano, a walnut, uh, a very fine musical instrument. Uh, and it's, it was in our home as our children were growing up. And our kids have memories of playing under that piano while their mom was sitting there playing the piano and writing some songs. Uh, many of you, uh, perhaps none of you know, I don't know, I'm uh, maybe speaking out of term, but she had 20, one or 22, I don't remember, songs published back uh, in, in the 70s uh, when the kids were just little. And, and so now this piano, we don't, we don't need it anymore. We've, we've graduated to a, a bigger and a better piano and this one is is now being kind of kicked around, and I don't mean any disrespect there. Uh, our daughter has had it for many years, but uh, she has moved uh, to a place that she, she can't get no room for it. So she got it in storage. So now they're, they're tired of paying storage, paying, paying rent. So they're looking for somebody else to, uh, to, in the family to take the piano. Well, we've got a bunch of musicians in the piano. My, uh, and, uh, I misstated that. We've got a bunch of musicians in the family, and many of them play keyboard or piano. Uh, uh, you see, I, uh, I married a musician. That's the closest I ever got to being one. But then all three of our children are musicians. And all three of them married musicians. And all of our grandkids are musicians. And they play a wide variety of instruments. Anyway, the point is our daughter wanted that piano uh, some time ago. Uh, because of the memories she had of playing on the floor under there while mama was playing the piano and, and that sort of thing. Uh, and now she wants to quit paying storage on it, so she asked one of her brothers uh, if he thought one of his kids would like to have it. And, and cutting through some detail, he said, not one of my kids. Uh, um, I'd like to have it in, in my own house. I have those same memories of 
playing around under the piano. He, uh, so we'll, we'll get that accomplished soon. Uh, not sure exactly when, but the point is I want to, I'm, I'm talking to you about the heritage that Paul was talking to Timothy about in terms of his knowledge of the scriptures. Just know who told you them. Now, I, I'll give you one more little example before I move on, but this, this one more example, when I was a kid growing up in my neighborhood, there was a bully down the street. He lived like three houses down across the street. And uh, he didn't, he, he, he didn't want to do right. As a matter of fact, he was a pretty bad person. Uh, he, just, he just was mean. <coughs> Now, when I say he was, I'm speaking of him in past tense because when he was 22 years old, give or take, he died in a car wreck running from the police. Um, drove off the embankment of the interstate highway at, at a bridge and the car rolled and, and, and he is no more. Well, that boy was, a year older than me. And so he was my closest in age playmate in the neighborhood there. And I can tell you that the things that he was teaching me weren't good. And, and if my mom and daddy had realized what I was being exposed to, uh, they would have forbidden me. But I didn't tell them. And normal, I, was, I think I was a normal kid, and I didn't tell them. But the, but the point is, knowing the source of who you learn stuff from, and whether or not you can rely on it, and I knew that the stuff I was learning from this fellow, this, this kid named Richard, and I, that, that what, what I was learning from Richard wasn't good for me. But I knew what, was, what I was learning from my mom and my dad in church and in scripture reading was good for my soul. It was food for me. Let's go back and start with verse 14 and read through the end of the chapter, verse 17. So here we are at 14. And Paul says, Tim, continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good work. Now we go back to verse 16 for just a minute before we move on and look at these things that are being profitable for doctrine. And doctrine basically is, is telling you how to act. Uh, that, that's, what, that's what doctrine's for. That's what scripture's for, tell you how to act. 
tell you how to treat one another, tell you how to have interpersonal relationships with other children of God, if you will. And uh, reproof is, is basically a rebuke uh, uh, to, to uh, say, no, 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 no. And then the next one for correction is about the same. It says the same thing. I'm going to correct you in what it is that you are doing. And then instruction in righteousness tells you how to do right what to do to do right. You, 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 you give a man an honest day's work for an honest day's wage. And there's lots of ways to put that, to make that fit and to make that work there, but I'm going to leave it at that. Verse 17 again, that the man of God may be perfect. That means complete. Perfect means complete. That the man of God may be complete thoroughly. That means from the inside out. Furnished unto all good works. The second section in our lesson today is in uh, second Peter, second. If you'll turn here and look, you can see on the little, little chart here. Second Peter's all the way down here. So you come from Second Timothy, past Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James, First Peter, Second Peter. Uh, in in my book, it's uh, twenty pages. So you turn twenty. 20 pages to, to get to, to 2 Peter uh, chapter 1. And we're, we've just got a few uh, verses again, starting with verse 16 and going to the end of the chapter. And this is uh, Peter's writing as opposed to Paul's, so the point is, uh, we're getting uh, confirmation from uh, a different writer, a different individual. I mean, and, uh, all told, and I don't remember the number of how many, I know that these are 66 books all here, but I don't remember the number of authors there are. It's like 40 or something like that. So 40 authors, whatever the number is, uh, are, are, are in agreement in writing this book that you're holding in your hand or got laying in front of you there. And Peter is just one of those. Let me, let me remind you about Peter before we look at the scripture that he, uh, that he wrote that uh, Peter was... Uh, I, you know, I didn't know him personally, but he was he was he was pretty much he was pretty much a scoundrel. Uh, he uh, he betrayed his best friend. But that was before he wrote this. He learned along the way. But Peter uh, wasn't sure who Jesus was. He just knew there was something that attracted him to follow Jesus and to learn at his feet and to listen to what he had to say. But he didn't always apply it. Many times he did, and when he did, he had good results. And I challenge you to uh, uh, try it and have good results. And don't worry about the scoundrel in you. 
because once you accepted the grace of Jesus see I think the grace uh, and, and this is a little hard uh, for me to describe because I've, I've done this so many times you, you, know, you don't know what I'm talking about um, and then and then this, this is a little bunch but the grace of Jesus covers so much stuff he, he would have everybody going on this narrow way and through the straight gate if people just would but they won't so they're going to go through the broad way and the wide gate that leads to destruction and that's just the way it seems to be but Peter Peter's faith going back to that word that we were using a bit ago in Paul's writing to Timothy Peter's faith that Jesus was really the Christ and really the Messiah did not solidify it did not come to full fruition until Jesus was crucified, buried, and raised from the dead. And then, okay, so this that we're going to read today that Peter wrote was after his faith that Jesus was the Christ had solidified. It had become positive. He, he, he knew that Jesus was who he said he was. Look at verse uh, 16. Chapter 1, verse 16. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were, I'm adding the word we in there, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Now see that one little verse describes what I, I've spent the last five, five minutes or however, maybe, maybe longer, telling, telling you about that, that you know, we've not followed cunningly devised fables. Well, you see, there were some false teachers. We, in, in our recent times, we studied uh, the Judaizers, for instance. And uh, they, these guys didn't know Jesus. They, they knew the law. And they thought that salvation, you had know, to keep the law. Well, they were not even keeping the law themselves. But they wanted to put that on the, on the Galatians, if you recall. That's who we were studying about at the time. Well, these were, the, the, the things that those fellows were, were saying were cunningly devised fables, meaning that they studied and on purpose devised some things. We got that same stuff going on on the channels that Tom watches. Uh, the, the people, the, the people uh, who have all of these causes and the signs that they, that they hold up. Uh, those are just uh, fables. Those, those are just cunningly devised uh, cute little sayings. Green eggs and ham matter. Green eggs and ham. <laughs> oh no, I'm sorry, I got those colors wrong. Yeah. <laughs> so again, verse 16, we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you, in other words, when we told you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. 
He said, Peter said, I followed him around for three years. I was an eyewitness. Verse 17. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Now that's a reference back to uh, when Jesus was baptized and by John the Baptist. And, uh, and the, the voice came from heaven. This is my beloved son. I don't, I don't know if Peter was on the riverbank that day. I don't know. But I bet you if he wasn't, if you let me bet you, I'll bet you that uh, word got around. And Peter, Peter had heard that. Verse 18. And this voice which came from heaven, we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. Well, how do you get more sure than that? Well, let's see. Whereunto ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Now, he's going through some um, poetic uh, language there describing <coughs> um, describing what happens in our in our in our inner being, if we if we just will take heed until the light comes, and it, and and he's telling us, and I'm telling you, and I'm of course I'm nobody, and he's he's somebody, but. Uh, that if you just stay in the Word, this will come to you. The Spirit of God won't stay away from somebody who is reading God's Word. Mm -mm. He kind of describes that as the day star at, right at the end of verse 19 arising in your hearts. That, in my mind, <clears throat> that comes through to me as though I'm trying to understand something. I'm trying, I'm reading and trying to understand it. And if I just stay with it and, and keep looking at what it's saying, that then it, ah, all of a sudden the sun rises and light is shined or light shines or is shown upon uh, whatever the circumstances and situation might be that you're concerned about at the time. Verse 20, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. Now, the key word in that to me is the word private. There is just no prophecy at all that fits one somebody and doesn't fit everybody else. It's not a private thing. Uh, Billy Graham, for instance, I'll just throw out that name, but uh, I, I could use uh, uh, you know the other uh, fellows that come to our church. Uh, 
Uh, uh, uh, uh, well, I say I could use their names right now. I can't think of any of them. Dr. Lee. Uh, when he comes to our church, and what's the other fellow's name? Van something or other. Yeah, Andre Van Zandt. Uh, the, the, the interpretation of prophecy in this book is not private to Andre Van Zandt. It, it, it's yours, 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 yours. Just as much as it is his. It's, it's, it's not uh, of any private interpretation. But you can have a different experience than he has or than I have, but somewhere along the line you, 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 you have a personal experience with Jesus of Nazareth. And it's, it's in here somewhere. I, I, I don't know exactly. I don't, I don't know if they've, if they've found uh, where our soul is or our spirit is, but it's in there somewhere. Every, every time, and, and, and from time to time, uh, especially last year when I was uh, in the hospital so much, uh, I had very many MRIs and CT scans and that sort of thing. And the first question I ask him every time is, did you, did you find a brain in there? <laughs> That's what I want to know. Uh, you think? Uh, no. You think? No. Uh, they won't acknowledge I've never had anybody acknowledge it yet that they did. But, but the point is, I'm using that as the same as saying uh, whether there's a soul in there or not. Uh, and I've never asked them that uh, question because I know they can't find my soul. I, th I think I keep it down here in, in, in one of these toes, I'm not sure. Uh, anyway, uh, it's, 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 it's just that we each have our own personal relationship with the Christ and, and, and it's not the same for everybody. Verse 21, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Now he's talking about all of this Old Testament here. And of course we know this is Moses wrote these five and then most of these are uh, have, have the names of the ones that wrote them, not all of them, but most of them. And uh, the law and the history and then poetry and then the prophets, five major prophets and then 12 minor prophets. He's talking about this. Now he's writing over here. But he's writing to his contemporaries, to his people that are alive at the same time, his friends, if you will. And he's talking about this portion of Scripture of old time, it says, verse 21. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. In other words, none of these fellas whose names are on books or even if their names are not on the books if we know who wrote them uh, they didn't make it up it wasn't cunningly devised fables but it came by the word of God I was listening to a, 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 a YouTube, YouTube presentation uh, by 
Mark Lowry. Y'all know does the name Mark Lowry mean anything to you? Uh, occasionally sings with the Gaither vocal band, if you know anything about that. But anyway, he was saying uh, in, in his little, little thing, he, and he's, a, he's a goofball, he's funny, he's a comedian, all of that. He was saying the book of Psalms, he said, we wouldn't have a book of Psalms <coughs> if they'd had Prozac back then. <laughs> Because you read the book of Psalms and he says David was up in one psalm and then he's down in the next psalm. And he's up in the next psalm and he's down in the next one. Well, if they had Prozac back then, he said that just all evened out. <laughs> I don't know how he knows that for sure, except maybe he uses Prozac. You know? <clears throat> so let's go to Psalms. Chapter 19. Now that's back to the left, uh, roughly in the mid middle of the Bible. And uh, you can look at the chart up here and kind of tell where it is. It's got all of these books in front of it. You get down to Psalms and it's got and all these books after it. <coughs> so Psalms number 19 is one we're going to look at uh, concerning Scripture being divine revelation. Psalm number 19. Here we go. Everybody ready? The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth His handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. See, we've, uh, we, we've barely figured out, and it's only the smartest you know, aerospace technicians and, and uh, whoever it is that, that figures out the rotation of all of the things in the universe. But at, at David's time, he thought the, he thought the earth was flat. And, and he didn't understand how these things happened. But he saw them happen for enough years that he, de he concluded that the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork and the stars at night too. He didn't put that in there, but I'll put that in. Day unto day uttereth speech and night unto night showeth knowledge. In other words, somebody had to know something in order to make it all work right. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. He, he just said all around the world these things happen. Their line, verse 4, their line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun. Yeah, the sun just plays around all day. And he gets tired and goes to sleep. Wakes up the next morning, plays all day. Verse 5, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. He's talking about the sunrise there. He comes out of his chamber and he rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race to get to the other side and then go down into the darkness. His going forth is from the end of the heaven and his circuit unto the ends of it. 
and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. I wonder if he was talking about Houston, Texas. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, Enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true. How they are. And righteous altogether. See, the judgment of the Lord being true and righteous means he doesn't depend on a mob holding a bunch of signs up. That's not, that's not, that doesn't influence God's righteousness or his judgment. There are more to be desired, verse 10 I am, <clears throat> More to be desired are they than gold. Yeah, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned. And in keeping of them there is great rewards or reward. So keep, keep, his, keep his statutes and you get great reward. Verse 12, who can understand his errors? Now, that's saying, uh, which one of those people in the mob can understand their error? All they want to do is point fingers at somebody else. And they don't look or think about their own errors. Who can? I don't understand my own errors because I'm right all the time. No. <laughs> <clears throat> Except when I'm not, of course. No. And, and Tom records that. So <laughs> I got... I got uh, evidence of all that. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Hmm. There must be something in us that's secret to us that we don't, we don't know about. But just in case we're not right all the time, we, we probably ought to be humble, humble, humble. Have humility about it and, and not brag the way I do. Secret faults. Cleanse thou me from my secret faults. And keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them, the presumptuous sins, not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be accepted in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Hallelujah.
turn to the right. Um, uh, 60 pages to Psalm number 119. This is the fourth and final segment in our lesson today. <coughs> Psalm number 119, starting with verse 105. Shortest chapter in the Bible. Yeah. <laughs> This, I could I could spend a long time on talking about the uh, the, the academics and I, I don't want to do that about this being an acrostic uh, poem writing where each section of of, uh, of chapter 119 starts with the same letter of uh, the Hebrew alphabet. And and I can go on and on explaining the, but 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 that would take too much time. We need to get to verse one o five, which is probably very close to being the most quoted scripture in the entire Bible. I don't, I don't know for sure. I don't have any statistics. I can't prove it. But how many times have you heard, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path? That's neat. I've never heard that before. You're watching the wrong channels. I'm telling you. <laughs> <coughs> Next verse, I have sworn and I will perform it that I will keep my or thy righteous judgments. I, I wish he, I, w I wish, I wish that, that middle phrase wasn't in there the way they've got it, but I didn't write this. David uh, wrote it because the Spirit led him to do so. But let's leave out the middle. Uh, verse for a moment and read it this way. I have sworn that I will keep thy righteous judgments. Yeah, we have. When we accept Jesus of Nazareth as being the Son of God, being our Savior, um, David didn't know uh, the Son of God. David didn't know Jesus. David lived back here in this time, and Jesus didn't come till over in here. Okay? So David had some experience with some other part of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. <coughs> but whatever he had, caused him to swear that he would keep God's righteous judgments. And he says, I am afflicted very much. Quicken me, O Lord, according unto thy word. Accept, I beseech thee, the free will offerings of my mouth. Here, here again, I wish, that, I wish that I beseech thee wasn't in there right, right there. Let's just read that without that. Without that, accept the free will offerings of my mouth. Now, the free will offering of his mouth is when he's going around saying, "Praise God, glory be to God, Hallelujah." That those are the the kinds of things. And then then he's beseeching, he's begging basically God to please please accept my oral, my verbal praises unto you. Middle of verse eight. O Lord, and teach me thy judgments. Yeah, he's the best teacher 
anyway. Sometimes we learn, most of the time when he's teaching us, we learn the hard way. It's better if you learn from somebody else who loves you and will share with you. Uh, and I don't mean any disrespect to any of you who may not have had this kind of upbringing, but from from my children playing around under the piano or at, at Dorothy's bedside, uh, it's a lot, a lot better to learn from somebody like that that cares for you than to learn from God. Because when you learn from God, it usually is a pretty tough test there. Verse 9, my soul is continually in my hand, yet Oh, I thought it was in my toe. I don't know that long ago. My soul is continually in my hand, yet do I not forget thy law. The wicked have laid a snare for me, yet I erred not from thy precepts. Um... I, I could tell you a personal uh, story. It doesn't amount to anything except to me. Uh, but back in uh, 1971, I changed jobs. And I was not well received by the uh, people in the company that I went to. I was hired to be a department manager. and. The department already existed. It had, I don't know, 25 employees or something like that just in that in that department. And uh, they didn't treat me well at all. And they, they uh, lied about me and they uh, did everything they could do to get rid of me. They didn't like this new guy that showed up there. And after, I don't, I don't remember how many months passed, but there was a few months passed, and finally the boss, the president of the company, called me into his office, and boy was he mad at me. And he chewed me out up one side and down another, and I just sitting there just across the desk from him. He's standing up, and I've described this to you before. He was, he had a habit. He used only he only used pencils. He didn't use ballpoint pens. And 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 he would uh, put pencil in his mouth like this and talk we talk with pencil in his mouth. And when he got through or, or not through necessarily, but he'd take a breath, he'd take that pencil out and throw it against the wall. Break the pencil. And I mean this guy was just so anyway, the point the point of I mean I could give you a bunch of details here, but I'm just sitting there listening to him. I'm not reacting, I'm not getting all stirred up, I'm not anything. He said, You know what the trouble is with you, John? You don't ever get mad. <coughs> anyway <coughs> excuse me. In that meeting, he fired me, and I said, if you really want me to leave, I will, uh, and I'll go peaceably, but uh, I'm doing every day the things that you told me you hired me to do. And I've got a lot more of those things to do. And I'm I'm here by seven o'clock in the morning. And he showed up about ten, but I'm here at seven o'clock in the morning, and I'm working hard to get all these things fixed up. Anyway, again, I'll say, make a long story short. He hired me again. Yeah. Gave me a raise and more authority than what I had before because I sat there calmly 
and just responded to the accusations against me. And that's, that's what David is saying here one, in number one, one, verse 110. He says, The wicked have laid a snare for me, yet I erred not from thy precepts. I didn't err either. Sitting there listening. I didn't blame anybody. I didn't accuse anybody. I just said I'm doing the job that you hired me to do. And I told him one thing that kind of embarrassed him or whatever. I said, the reason I don't get mad is I learned a few years ago. I learned that when you're mad, you can't make good business decisions. When you're mad, it takes, you waste all the time that it takes for you to get mad up to here. And then you waste all the time that it takes you to come back down to where you can be reasonable again and make a good business decision. Well, I was indicting him because that's the way he acted and, and carried on. Uh, but but anyway, he, he ended up hiring me back and paying me more, and uh, so th th things worked out well. I, I worked for him for eight years and, and one month, and when I left there uh, uh, on my last day, uh, he fetched me to his office and he reached his hand across the desk and he said, John, I'm going to say something to you that I've never said to anybody ever before, but if you ever decide you want to come back here, I'll have a job for you. That's because I followed God's precepts, kept my cool under fire, if you will, didn't blame anybody, just went about doing my business. There's quite a few scriptures in Proverbs that, yeah, that yeah. confirm the things you're saying. One that I think is right off my head is a fool rages. Yeah. You know, and uh, there's, a, there's a bunch of others. Yep. Uh, being calm, being calm. Well, that fellow was a good bit older than me, and he's deceased. He's, uh, I, I don't know when he passed, but he's been gone for several, uh, several years. So uh, he's not here to uh, defend himself against the things that I say and describe about him. Verse 111 says, Thy testimonies have I taken as an heritage forever, for they are the rejoicing of my heart, and I have inclined mine heart to perform thy statues always. And we would put an S on that. We'd say, perform thy statutes always, even unto the end. I wish I wouldn't have taken my Prozac today. It would have been so easy out. Yeah, and I wish you hadn't. I wish you hadn't taken so much time talking to because I'm, I'm way over time. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm, Next time I'll take my Prozac. I'm, I'm, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Anybody have any comments or thoughts or uh, complaints or criticisms? Or y'all have all been kind of quiet today, except for except for Tom. <laughs> yeah. The contract. <laughs> All right. Let's pray. Lord, we're thankful today for your goodness to us and your mercy to us and for this word that you've left to us that we might have it as examples, that we might learn from it, that we might learn how to act 
before our fellow man and before you. We've come here to learn about you, and we've done that today. We've also come to worship you, and we're going to worship you in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, who indeed is the Christ. Amen. Thank you all for coming today.